Last time in the video I introduced holonomic constraints and I also talked about a specific example of two particles connected by a rigid rod okay and we looked at the virtual work in that case. Just to remind you we found that the virtual work done by that system was zero but individual forces acting on each of the particles Okay, so if you take particle number one and you look at the uh, forces which are acting on it due to constraint and if you find out the virtual work it is not zero. Okay, only for the entire system it turned out to, to be zero. And that's generically true for uh, constraint forces. It's not that the work done um, by the forces acting on individual particles is zero. It is only when you consider all the particles of the system and look at all the constraints, then all the, f and, and you add up the work done uh, by these forces on each particle and you sum them up, that is zero, okay? So that's what, uh, one thing which should we should remember and that's what we are going to utilize today. Now goal for today's lecture is to write down the principle which is uh, called D'Alembert principle. This will be our starting point for writing down equations of motion later. Okay, so that's what we are going to do and the task is quite simple here and the, the principle is very nice and simple. So let's uh, begin with that. So imagine we have a system of n particles. Okay, so a lot of uh, particles and each particle is experiencing some forces due to constraint and also forces which are not due to constraint. Okay, so I divide all the forces on each particle in two sets, F primes and Fs, okay? Primes with are due to constraint and Fs uh, without primes are not due to constraint, okay? And then just, just now I told you that if I take the virtual work done by all of these forces, F primes, and you add all these virtual works, then it will turn out to be zero. And that's what we are going to utilize in writing down um, D'Alembert principle. Okay, let me go to the, yes. So here we are. So I'm looking at a system of n particles. Okay. Uh, each of mass m i and where i runs from one to n, the n number of particles. I'm writing down small m right now, okay? And then there are forces of constraint that are given by the equations, okay? The, the holonomic constraints. So let's say there are k number of constraints, so phi one, phi two, so and so forth to phi k, and these being equal to zero are, are the equations of constraints. So that's what I'm imagining right now. Let me write down. There are forces of, no, not, not of, let's say, there are forces that are acting on the particle that are acting on each of the particles. Okay, and as I said, I will divide them into two categories. One is F prime, okay? So particle number I has a force Fi prime acting on it, and this Fi prime is due to constraints, and this is the sum of all con constraint forces, okay? If there are several forces which are acting due to constraint, I add them all of, uh, all of them, and that's what F prime is. And the another uh, set is F. And this is also the sum of all forces other than the constraint forces, okay, on particle number i. Okay. Now, each of the particle is going to evolve in time according to Newton's, Newton's second law, okay. So if I write down mass into acceleration, okay, I have a double dot here. And that will be the sum of F prime and F. 
f prime i plus f i right that's correct now you see um, we are not very happy and excited about this equation this is true this equation is true but it's not very nice because because you see on the right hand side you have f prime so you need to know what the force of constraint is in order to solve this equation and tell what the trajectory of the particle is but now you may not necessarily know what are the forces of constraint acting right let's say um, let, let's take an example to understand this let's imagine that you have one surface okay let, let's say a flat surface and you have a particle which is constrained to remain on that surface and on the top of it you have certain very massive particles okay which very strongly exert forces on this guy so let's say you have a surface a particle on it and then there are other other particles here and there which are very massive and they are all moving around because they are all interacting with each other this guy will also move around because it is getting um, forces from all other particles but this one has to remain on the on the on the surface now it may naively appear that i can plug all this and in this equation uh, newton's second law which i have written down here okay and and solve it but the problem is the force which the surface is going to exert on the particle here okay so let's say this is the do i have a sheet here yes okay let's say this is your surface okay and your particle is going to be here on this now if the particles which are at other places okay the massive very massive ones if they are exerting a very strong force downwards okay let's say force is very very strong then for the particle on the surface to remain on the surface the surface has to push it strongly upwards but if let's say these particles move away in time okay they they go further away so that the pull of these particles on on the guy here is lesser much smaller let's say then the reaction force by the surface will also be much smaller okay meaning f prime will be smaller in magnitude so the forces f primes are not known a priori they they evolve as um, the system evolves okay and that is why this equation though correct it's not very useful in solving um, solving your problem unless you could write down explicitly what fi primes are okay so that's the that's the difficulty we face with uh, this um, where the equations of motion are written down right now in front of us and that is what the situation is uh, and that's what we want to address uh, in the remaining of the of the lecture okay so let's see what we can do about this what i'll do is i'll take the fi the forces which are other than the constraint forces to the left hand side and let's see what we get mi ri double dot minus fi equals fi prime okay i wish i had written it more neatly but um, okay let me just equals f i prime okay trivial now what i do is i take my system and do virtual displacements that are cons consistent with the forces of constraint at the time okay so let me do virtual displacements and dot both the left and right hand sides with virtual displacements okay this might already uh, ring a bell to you now as i said few minutes ago that the right hand side is not zero that the virtual work done by each uh, 
uh, one uh, virtual work done on each particle by this forcial constraint is not necessarily zero. You have seen this explicitly in the case of two particles which are rigidly attached. But if I sum over the entire system, okay, then this is true. And that's why I'll sum over all the particles, i equals 1 to n. Okay, now this is true that the virtual work done is zero. And this is what is D'Alembert's principle. Okay, it says that if I sum over all the particles, I'm just writing down the equation again, m i r i double dot minus f i dotted with the virtual displacements this is equal to zero okay let me put it in a box now you, you might have already realized that this is a nice equation because your f primes are gone now they are not here in the uh, the problem now this is dalembert principle okay okay pay attention to this let's see what it is saying it's saying that um, m r i m i r i double dot minus f i dotted with delta r i is zero now imagine for a moment that there were no forces of constraint if that wa were the was the case then all the delta ris, the virtual displacements of each of the particle, you could have chosen them all independently of each other, right? They will be all independent of each other. See, the delta ris are constrained because of the constraint equations. You remember, some time back we wrote down d phi and then we wrote down d phi, which was term in terms of delta ris, and that was the equation of, const uh, that was the constraint that virtual displacements had to satisfy. Let, let me go back, let me try to see if I can find that equation. Yeah, here for example, here if you see, uh, here this one. You see, the virtual displacements delta ri had to satisfy this equation. And they were not, so you, you cannot independently choose one delta r, delta r1 to be this, delta r2 to be to this, delta r3 to be this, okay? They have to satisfy the constraints. And that's what I'm saying here, okay? But imagine if your uh, system was not constrained by any constraint forces, then you could choose delta ris to be independent of each other. And then in that case, for this sum to be zero, you will conclude that whatever is written in the square brackets here, m r i, m i, r i double dot minus f i, they all have to individually vanish, right? Just because uh, delta r i's are independent of each other, okay? So if that was the case, then you recover your Newton's equations, which is just uh, uh, ex uh, mass times acceleration is the force, and there is only one force because the constraint is gone. But now, because now the situation is that we have constraints, but then the delta ris are not independent of each other. So I cannot conclude that mi ri double dot minus fi is zero, which is good that otherwise it would mean that I have made a mistake. But then it also suggests that if I could write down this equation, I take this equation and instead of using delta, uh, instead of using ris, I use the generalized coordinates, which I was talking about some time back. Okay, remember generalized coordinates are all independent of each other. Now if I could write down this relation using generalized coordinates, then the delta ris will get replaced by delta qis. And because they are independent of each other, the displacements delta qis could be taken independently of each other. And then whatever would be left in the square bracket here, not square, this is a round bracket here. This is a round bracket, okay. This, one, this bracket is called round bracket, okay? That I would be able to say that that part is zero, just like uh, I was saying here for the case of a system in which there are no, no forces of constraint. 
and that would give me my equations of motion without the forces of constraint and that would be our achievement right and that's what we are after writing down equations of motion without constraint forces but the price to pay would be that we will be using generalized coordinates instead of instead of cartesian coordinates but that's not a big price that's 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 okay we we are quite comfortable with using generalized coordinates so that's the goal for uh, next video and those equations are which we are after they are called euler lagrange equations and that's what we are going to obtain next time see you till uh, till then okay i think yeah stop